So we now have the recording. And just to restate, we're discussing Leo Strauss, a couple of presentations that he gave in the 1930s on the intellectual situation of the present and the religious situation of the present, included as appendices in this book, Reorientations. Our honored and delightful guest to be walking us through these texts is Joe, who also goes under the name of Thinian Stranger on Twitter. Like I said, I'll put the handle here for everybody to follow, which I strongly recommend that you do. And he's an excellent resource, a great guy, a careful reader of Strauss and all things related to Strauss and political philosophy. It's a real pleasure and privilege to have him here. And with that said, I'm going to hand it over. And Joe, you can walk us through whatever you've prepared and whatever's on your mind concerning Strauss and his essay. Okay, so uh, testing, testing, how, how does it sound? <laughs> okay, uh, I'm out here in the desert and, uh, you know, the air conditioning runs uh, all the time. And so sometimes it's a little loud in the background. Um, so uh, this is uh, a, a really a great honor for me. Uh, I can't thank you enough for this, Michael. Um, uh, getting to speak about this particular topic uh, with this particular text is something that's really near and dear to me because uh, I have studied uh, from uh, one of the translators. In fact, uh, he's uh, on my PhD uh, committee, uh, Martin Yaffe. Uh, and, and I always let people know that uh, if you want to see depth of thought with clarity uh, of articulation, uh, just pick up anything by Martin Yaffe. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, I've had the good fortune to actually study directly from uh, a number of the contributors uh, in that volume. Uh, I'm actually good friends with uh, one of the people who at the time uh, was uh, helping Yaffe as an undergraduate translate that particular text. Uh, he's now a tutor at St. John's, uh, New Mexico. Uh, amazing guy, uh, specializes in Heidegger. Uh, just a really great group of people, all of them uh, involved in that. Um, now, that being said, uh, I'm very nervous right now uh, because I, I was, you know, it's it's one thing to be in spaces, right? Because I'm often just wearing literally only a pair of shorts. My dog is sitting on my lap and I'm just sort of sitting behind. I've got my phone and I'm just chatting away and like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because the voice can be hidden very well or the voice can, can operate fine uh, without people having to see you. Um, you know, it was one thing when Twitter was just tweets. Uh, and now they stepped it up to where it's, you can hear people's voices. It's always nice to put a voice to someone. Uh, and now all of a sudden uh, we're going live, we're, we're video. Uh, so I have to keep an eye on how many people just unfollow me because they're like, ah, God, uh, the sheen from his dome was blinding. Uh, I didn't want to see it. Uh, he just, something about his appearance bothered me. <laughs> so anyway, uh, you know, he squints, right? Uh, but, but anyway, um, let uh, me just say, let me just say, so the Twitter spaces, as those of you who have been on them know, and like Joe just said, they're audio only like Clubhouse, I think. And we all post like maniacs on Twitter, or at least many of us do, uh, the best of us. I know maybe the best of us don't post on Twitter at all, I'm not sure. But this truly is a good opportunity to connect in the way that we would off of a computer. Now still, we're through Zoom, we're at a distance, there could be technical difficulties, but it is a treat to get to be with somebody more than just hearing them or reading what they write. So I appreciate you being willing to come on camera. And those of you who want to keep your cameras on, it's great just to be able to be with you, to see you and to uh, react together with you to what it is that we're going to be learning together. So we should take full advantage of this, this particular modality. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we're, we're living in real time through an actual revolution as far as technology is concerned. I think that what, uh, you know, it was one thing when podcasts came out and, you know, people like Joe Rogan were huge and all these sorts of things. But now with spaces on Twitter, it's sort of the everyman's podcast. Uh, so I think that's going to have to be reckoned with. Uh, that's I'm going to keep an eye on what's happening to uh, the actual podcast taking place. Uh, but now that being said, because I am live uh, and, you know, I have to operate under a pseudonym simply because, I mean, there are bad actors uh, and they do seek to harm people professionally. But uh, for the most part, everyone already knows uh, the in academia, they already know who I am. Uh, I'm not really too concerned about that whatsoever. Uh, I don't mind sort of living on the fringes of being in academia, but not in academia, right? Uh, and plus, you know, I, I always, my thing is that I, I just keep things, I try to keep things as classy as possible, uh, friendly as possible, and just with genuine goodwill towards other people. Uh, and always want to see the best, whether or not we agree at the end of the day, or whether we even begin to agree politically or whatnot, because obviously... It's the politics is that's uh, that's the poison uh, for everyone these days, uh, and we all 
sort of get intoxicated on it. Uh, yeah, Joe, I just want to take a moment, if you don't mind, I just want to interrupt just for a moment and say that this intention that we have in our time together, everybody who's here, everybody who will be watching this later, it really is meant to be, in the best sense, a community of friendship in an inquiry into what matters to us. It's not about whether we share the same responses to the questions, but for sure, this is an environment of respect, of decency, and of a shared desire to learn from great teachers. All of us here have had them, otherwise we wouldn't be together. Many of us are trying to become great teachers and to model the excellences that we've had the privilege to benefit from ourselves. So if anybody, and I know that it's not the case of the people here, but just to say, if anybody here thought they might come in with the intention of disrupting, I appreciate the fact that you would take your time to want to do that on a Wednesday night in a talk on Strauss. There are probably more interesting things you could be doing as far as the disruption goes, but not many more interesting you could be doing as far as the listening and instruction goes. So uh, if you had any bad intent, just set it aside and let's be together as learners of a great text uh, and as a community of friends. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I always tell people if I was not, uh, you know, if, 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 the, if the goodwill towards other people was not palpable, I would not be who I am. Uh, I would not have become friends with Martin Yaffe. I would not have been able to become friends with the people, a number of people who are in the actual text. Dude, they, can, they were contributors uh, if they weren't outright uh, translators. Uh, and so that's always only because, uh, you know, we humble ourselves before uh, the great books uh, in the same way that we need to humble ourselves before great teachers. That's not to say that humility is a virtue, uh, because remember, uh, to climb out of the cave, uh, which we're going to talk about a lot, uh, you've got to have that fighting spirit. Uh, and a number of the greatest professors on Strauss that I know of, uh, they really appreciate the fighting spirit. Uh, but I think we all know the difference between uh, the fighting spirit versus the heckling spirit. Uh, but uh, in any case, um, so, uh, so, okay, so that being said, uh, the, the title of the book is, is crucial, right? Reorientation. Uh, something has happened to Strauss uh, that's going to uh, cause a kind of a turning, right? Uh, everyone who's familiar with Plato is familiar with the, uh, the periagoge, right? The turning of the soul. Uh, and what's fascinating about Strauss is he got his PhD under uh, Kassirer. Uh, and Kassirer was just about the most famous neo-Kantian. Uh, and it's not very often that people associate, uh, for instance, Strauss or really any of his uh, students or his uh, the people, who, students in the very, very tertiary sense, like myself, uh, with someone like Kant. Uh, and so there's this fascination to, to sort of say, well, how did Strauss become Strauss, right? Because he certainly didn't get it from Kassirer, <laughs> right? Uh, but he certainly got something there, though. That's not to dismiss Kassirer, because uh, in the wings, right, uh, is always going to be someone like Heidegger, uh, and, or, or, for instance, Husserl. Uh, these people are extremely uh, important uh, to read uh, because Strauss read them, right? That's the key thing is Strauss read them. So it's not enough for us to simply read Strauss. We have to read who Strauss read. Uh, unfortunately, I see that that tends to be a stumbling block in a lot of uh, fields with Strauss is that people end up knowing Strauss's works extremely well. Uh, but you ask them about people that he's commenting on uh, and a lot of times they haven't even read them. For instance, they may not have even read the Critique of Pure Reason. Uh, they may not have even read he uh, Hegel's uh, Phenomenology. Uh, but, you know, they might hate Hegel, <laughs> uh, but they haven't read Hegel, right? Uh, and that's going to be important uh, for what we're going to talk about here in a second. Uh, because, uh, you know, I made a funny tweet about this uh, with the ShamWow guy. Uh, but uh, <laughs> in the in the grand scheme of things, uh, you, you know, Strauss's depth and his breadth is enormous. It's not just that he studied Plato, right? It's not just that he did uh, that uh, or criticized Heidegger uh, or criticized Nietzsche. I mean, he almost invented entirely new fields or, or at least gave them a new life that didn't even exist. Uh, for instance, uh, Maimonides. Uh, no one would really think that someone like Maimonides uh, would appear uh, in, you know, a, a philosopher's uh, repertoire, right, uh, who's been uh, 
emphasizing people like Heidegger and Plato, uh, but he does. And in fact, Maimonides is rather crucial in these particular essays uh, by name, I mean, explicitly. Uh, so, so all of that is to say that, that there, was, there was something that happened uh, that reoriented right, Strauss's thought. Uh, and when you look at the time frame on all of these, uh, a lot of it has to do, uh, so as soon as Strauss was sort of done with his graduate work, uh, he, he gets this task uh, as a sort of a post-grad sort of thing uh, to write a, an essay on Spinoza. Uh, and immediately, almost immediately, Strauss realizes that there's a lot more at stake uh, than what might be required as just a simple essay for this uh, project that they were doing at the institution where he was affiliated with. Uh, and it ends up turning into his very first book, which is uh, rather long. Um, and, and unfortunately, it's not as read as a lot of other uh, Strauss's books are. Uh, and it turns out to be extremely crucial, right? Because I mean, just think about the title of, uh, of Spinoza's text, uh, you know, the, the Theological Political Tractatus. Uh, and immediately people start to, people should think of uh, what Strauss claimed eventually was uh, the source of all of his thought, uh, which is the theological political problem. Um, and so that's going to be very important there. And all of the themes that, that we're going to see in these early essays uh, are going to, uh, to pop up. And, and, and it occurred to me as I was reading these essays, uh, why I sort of fell so in love with them uh, is because I, I, in the same way that, that a lot of people who read, for instance, Nietzsche's untimely meditations, they find, for instance, in the second untimely meditation uh, on the use and uh, disadvantage of history for human life, they find an awful lot of later Nietzsche. Uh, and so it's almost as if Nietzsche sort of becomes Nietzsche. Uh, I mean, obviously he'd already written Birth of Tragedy, uh, but when he really starts to dig into the history there, the, the problem of history, which for Nietzsche is the problem of science really, uh, one and the same. Uh, that is where Nietzsche really sort of starts to, we, we see there, okay, I, this is the Nietzsche from Zarathustra that I recognize, right? Uh, and that's the kind of uh, effect that these essays had on me with Strauss. So, so, so you start to recognize that, that this, these essays, at least, to, to me at least, uh, mark the point where I think we can really say that Strauss is becoming Strauss, right? That's a famous essay, by the way, that uh, Heinrich Meyer writes is sort of how Strauss became Strauss. I think it might even be in this collection. Yeah, it's uh, the first chapter here. Uh, yeah, go figure. That, that's sort of me pointing out the obvious and didn't realize it was the obvious. Right? No, it's good. People, look, yeah. even, uh, even people who know Strauss well, who have read a lot of Strauss, there's always more to read and not everybody knows about this volume or these texts. And not everybody knows the secondary literature, Meyer and the like. So it's completely fine that we're pointing uh, pointing it out. It's important uh, to have on the record. Okay, so uh, what's so important about this volume is the appendices. It contains three translations, uh, all of them in the early 30s. I think it's uh, the first is uh, 1930, the second uh, 1932, and then I think 1934. So uh, the first one is uh, about this term that Strauss is going to, I don't know if he coins it, uh, but he certainly gives it his, his own take, uh, conspectivism. Uh, and then there's the second essay, which is uh, the religious situation of the present. Then there's the third essay, which is the intellectual present, uh, the intellectual situation of the present. Uh, now for our purposes, at least, um, and this is what happens when you read Strauss. Uh, you, read, you read his essays and you're like, you, it sort of, you know, with, and, and with me, it actually did, it blew my hair off. So, so, so it blows your hair off. Uh, and then you go back and you read it again and you're like, wow, I didn't see all this the first time. And so, so what happens is that where you could have read the original essay, all three of them maybe, uh, in one sit, well, maybe not one sitting, but pretty much on a Saturday, uh, you go back and try to read, for instance, the second one, which I did, uh, and you end up taking forever just to get through like the first couple paragraphs because you're just fine. Like so many things are clicking. You're like, ah, okay, I get it. This is all sort of matching. And I think it was either Strauss himself 
uh, or, or, or maybe Bloom uh, or someone uh, close in that orbit, they called it the matchstick theory of reading, right? Where you, you sort of, you find a loose end or something provocative here, uh, and then you find something else over here, uh, and then you, you, you think about it, you say, wait a minute, hold on, and then you sort of mix them together and psh, you know, it, it, it blows up uh, into a fire, a, a very productive fire. Yeah, Joe, uh, can that, I just say, can I say something here? If you don't mind, if just from time to time, I'll put in a comment, okay? I'm oh, not yeah, going to yeah. interrupt, but I'll just pa pause to put in a comment. So this uh, way of reading and way of experiencing reading Strauss, that you'll find connections between texts you maybe weren't expecting to find, or you'll return to something you've read after having read much else in the meantime and see it with fresh eyes. You will get the most out of reading Strauss if you're open to that experience. If you read him and think, I already read it, I already know it, there's nothing more to see and there's nothing more to say, you'll get something. But if you're open to its unraveling itself over time in many different ways, I think that's the real way to read Strauss. And in times we see he wrote to leave that experience for us as well. Yeah, well, while you were talking, I, I noticed that uh, one of my dearest friends, uh, Publius, uh, had, had sent a message or something uh, I am always in awe of Publius. Uh, that man, uh, the amount of knowledge that that man has uh, is amazing. And so I just want to say, if I know that Publius's eyes are on me, uh, I'm starting to sweat. Uh, I don't know how many of you all have seen that movie, Bedazzled with Brandon Fraser, uh, where they, he, the, Elizabeth Hurley grants him all these various things. Uh, and one of them is he becomes a famous uh, athlete uh, and he's in a locker room being interviewed after the game. And sweat is literally just, it, it's like a hose has somehow been attached and it's just sort of drip. And that, that's sort of how I feel when I have uh, the eyes of someone like Publius watching, because I know for a fact, Publius probably knows a hell of a lot more than I do about these things. Uh, but anyway, uh, so, so, so that being said, uh, one thing that occurred to me, and now this is pure speculation, so I don't want to, uh, this is the danger with reading Strauss. Uh, a lot of people will say that we, we begin to invent uh, the text because we say, oh, look at this. Uh, I counted how many words there are in this paragraph. And it's it, that the number is for the number uh, that's numerologically associated with nature. Oh my gosh, this paragraph itself, it contains everything, right? So, so I, I don't wanna do that, uh, but I do want to point out something very important and this is pure speculation. So I might be just completely wrong here, uh, but those three essays that are in the back, uh, everyone knows uh, that Al-Farabi was very important uh, for Strauss. And one of, one of Al-Farabi's most important texts uh, is about sort of uh, the, the philosophy of Plato and Aristotle, and it's broken up into three sections. Uh, and it turns out that the middle section, shockingly, right, it's always the middle. Uh, it's, I always think of Rocky, right, when he's, Rocky's all beat to hell, and uh, he says, I'm seeing three of them. Uh, and the Polly in the corner, I think, says, hit the one in the middle, <laughs> right? So uh, that's sort of the, the, the theory of the middles uh, with Strauss. Uh, but, but everyone knows with Al-Farabi, at least, uh, the middle chapter of the three turns out to be the most, well, not everyone knows that, but, uh, you know, spoiler alert. Uh, the middle chapter turns out to be the most important, and that one is on Plato. Now, in this particular collection, uh, now there's, there's an essay about these uh, these essays that I'll be talking about by by a very uh, very uh, sort of amazing scholar, uh, and I was looking through that essay, and one of the things I noticed is that uh, he said he was going to be focusing more on uh, the second essay, and you know my sort of sleuthing Straussian mind just said, now why might that be, uh, right? Uh, now I, again I'm just speculating. He provides reasons, substantive reasons for why that's the case. Uh, but I still think that's a little, uh, you know, uh, coincidental, right? Uh, that, you know, we've got three things and it turns out even the, even the contributor to the volume focuses on the middle one. Uh, but, you know, who knows? I'm, I, I'm, sometimes I, 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 my ambition gets the best of me and I'm, you know, maybe he didn't even have the first essay in mind. And he's like, you fool. I was only talking about the two, uh, but <laughs> whatever. Um, but I do want to emphasize uh, for, for, for at least my purposes, at least, uh, I think that the second essay is a little bit more important. Uh, and and I'll, I'll explain why. So again, we've got the first essay is about this interesting term, conspectivism. The second essay is about the religious situation of the present. 
The third essay is about the intellectual situation of the present. Now, uh, I'll be focusing on, on the second one because I, I think uh, at least I, I can make, it, at least if not a persuasive case, uh, certainly a, a case that is uh, hopefully worthy uh, of being uh, taken seriously. Um, okay, so uh, now one of my, one of my great professors, uh, he might even be in this volume, he once told us, he said, he said look, uh, anytime you're going to present, you never just want to be reading from a paper. Uh, you lose your audience and they're bored, uh, and they don't want to watch you read from a paper. Uh, but I'm new to this, uh, and uh, because, uh, look, we can only make Strauss as easy as Strauss can be made. Right? Uh, Strauss was a extremely meticulous reader. Uh, so uh, when you offer an analysis of Strauss, uh, even at sort of the introductory level, uh, you have to attend to the kind of the subtleties, the details. Uh, and so now I, I am fully hoping that all of this is for an introductory level audience and you guys might not even have read the essays, uh, and that's perfectly fine. And so my goal would be, uh, after this is said and done, uh, people would, people could say, uh, you know what? I didn't even read that essay, and I still got a lot out of it. I think I, I think I, I followed enough to where I can really read it now. Uh, so I'm hoping that that's the case. Uh, if it is, uh, I always keep my DMs open for anyone to message me and let me know. <laughs> um, uh, you get a lot of hate that way, but okay, I can deal with it. I'm, I'm a grown man. Um, Joe, let me just add one thing here quickly about Strauss and his writing. So for those of you, again, who know mostly his later, let's say, adult works and writings, they're remarkable, they're justly famous, and they're well worth reading repeatedly. But if you want to see, besides just uh, these volumes, which, of course, you should and must read in Reorientations, there's another volume called, uh, I think, like early Zionist writings or something like that, where Strauss is in his yeah. what is in his late teens, early twenties. And if you just read his analysis there, you'll see that this was a man who was born to think and write with just incision. And once you see that he had that from a young age, then it just gives you an appreciation for his writing across his life as a as a public uh, thinker. So for sure, this uh, Strauss was never easy to read, even if you read his young writing, but it's always so revealing, so powerful and precise that I think it's worth familiarizing yourselves with those early Zionist writings, so-called, which talk about the concept of the holy and other things, and with uh, the essays that we're discussing here. So just wanted to put yeah. that in. Yeah, I, I do want to just do a plug for those early writings because those those really are fascinating. Uh, uh, you know, he's got the essay uh, sort of in tangent with uh, Otto, right? Otto is sort of the famous uh, one who wrote that book about the holy, uh, but he's also got an essay in there on Freud, right? I mean, Strauss on Freud. Wow, this is gonna like get. Oh, I'll take some popcorn with that, uh, right? Um, and 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 I actually was fortunate enough to take an entire course uh, with one of the contributors uh, to this uh, volume, uh, Richard Rudiman, uh, on that text, uh, the early writings. Uh, just amazing stuff in there. So always, I always plug those. Um, now, so, so so what I want to be talking about is uh, what Strauss refers to. It, it's just about the most famous uh, image in all of Strauss. But I'm actually going to argue there's a more famous one. So, uh, so, so, so hang on. Um, uh, it, he calls it variously, uh, you know, the pit beneath the cave or the cave beneath the cave. Uh, and essentially, uh, you know, uh, let me just sort of let the cat out of the bag, uh, what he is referring to more than anything. Now, there's a number of ways that we can, we can phrase this uh, because there's a number of ways that Strauss phrases it. Uh, the cave beneath the cave, uh, is us, right? That's where we are at. Uh, that's where Strauss is at. That's where Strauss thinks that we're at. That's going to be where he argues that we're, we are at, uh, philosophically, uh, and at the level of uh, what we would refer to, uh, and, and uh, this is a crucial word, right? I always ha have to put the sort of quotation marks around it, culture, right? Uh, Strauss was one of the most uh, important figures, if for no other reason, then he pointed out the problems with some of the language that we use and we take it so casual, we don't realize that uh, they come along with a lot of unwitting uh, premises. Uh, there are certain words that we use that make us complicit 
in certain beliefs that we might not otherwise agree with. Uh, the most important of which is going to be culture. Um, another one is going to be intellectual, right? Uh, now, which by the way, is in one of the titles of the, uh, these essays. And another one is actually religion, right? So religion itself is going to be a problematic term uh, that Strauss is going to argue, right? Because it's not so much religion, uh, it's divine revelation. That's the key. Uh, and it's not so much uh, intellectual as it is that we want to be talking, we want to be sure that we're talking about philosophy. Uh, because all you have to do, uh, and this will come up too in these essays, uh, is look at the sort of the course offerings at any university. Uh, you can actually get entire majors in things called religious studies, uh, cultural studies, uh, all of these sorts of things. Strauss uh, was way ahead of the curve in recognizing early on that these, these are very problematic things. Uh, because they're going to, they, they presume things just in their very uh, existence, their mode of existence, uh, to sort of be maybe too philosophical about it, uh, that they don't even recognize, right? Because if you're going to simply speak about religions in the plural, or, that means that you're sort of putting them all on the same playing field, right? Uh, and, and in other words, uh, they all have their same value, right? That's another key term with Strauss, values, right? Uh, all of these things implicate us, uh, you know, whether we like it or not, uh, in this phenomenon known as nihilism. Uh, because uh, when you're saying that all things are equally true or equally valid, uh, then in a sense, nothing is, right? Um, but but we'll get there. Um, and, and, you know, I've sort of been rambling here because I want to try to stay away from reading from my notes uh, in order to not bore you guys uh, and, and such. Uh, but I did send Michael, uh, I, I'm, I'm more than happy to provide uh, copies of my notes for anyone that wants to look at them later. I'll make PDFs out of these later. Uh, but I sent Michael some pictures some screenshots of them. Uh, so you can sort of go through those. And I guess if you want to go back and read, uh, watch this video again at some point uh, with the actual notes. Uh, so we begin with sort of with, with the one essay I really want to focus on, which is uh, the religious situation of the present. Now, uh, what Strauss is going to say uh, from the very beginning, he's going to argue uh, that we concern ourselves with the religious situation of the present as Jews, right? So he's uh, now the setting for which uh, he is giving this talk is very important. Uh, and I, I would strongly encourage you to look into that. Uh, I don't want to go into all the details, but it is a sort of a theological setting. Uh, he's talking with Jews, uh, and that's what he wants to get to, is he wants to, he wants to get to the point where he's talking about uh, what became known as uh, sort of uh, the new criticism, uh, the, the new thinking. Uh, these are people like uh, uh, Rosenzweig, uh, there are people who have understood a lot of the modern philosophy and they are still of the faith. And so they are trying to reconcile uh, claims of philosophy with, with claims of divine revelation. Uh, I shouldn't even have used the word faith because that's more of a Christian concept, right? Because remember, he's speaking as a Jew, two Jews. Uh, now, the thing about uh, Jews versus Christians in this regard is that Judaism, uh, and Strauss makes an awful lot about this in many places, uh, Judaism is a religion of law. Uh, it is encompassing of the entirety of one's life, right? Think about the Mishnah Torah with Maimonides. Uh, it, it is, uh, it's not a matter of uh, conscience, right, with Christianity, which is sort of you believe, you have faith. Uh, that not so much for Judaism. Uh, it's uh, piety itself is much more an act of uh, following the law, uh, and and the law is all encompassing. That's the most important part. Uh, the law is all encompassing. It, it has already provided answers for everything, uh, all the way down to daily life. Uh, and now I don't want to get into that, but I just want to make everyone aware of that. So. Because what he says in the second essay, it's, it's really sort of comical. This is so, so typical of Strauss. Uh, he says, uh, I'm going to uh, address uh, the need for why we have to talk about this 
uh, and, and then I'm going to get to the, uh, the new thinking. Uh, he never gets to the new thinking. <laughs> he, he, only covers, uh, he only covers the reason of why they need to talk about the new thinking. Uh, so that actually becomes a joke later uh, and uh, that a lot of first generation students of Strauss are very familiar with. Uh, Strauss would often want to teach an entire course uh, it's always just on one text, right? Let's, the, the sort of the, the, the guiding theme for Strauss, and he gets this from Heidegger, uh, is learn to see, le learn to look at less and see more, right? So instead of having courses where it's like, you know, the reading list is just, you know, ah, you know, we're going to run through Hegel's phenomenology, and then we're going to go uh, directly into Fichte, uh, and then we're going to finish everything off with a complete reading of being in time. Uh, not so uh, anymore. Uh, much more important to look at less and see more uh, because uh, that, again, the hubris of thinking, and Strauss makes this very explicit in these essays in particular, the hubris of thinking that we can, you know, sit down and read over the weekend or maybe a few weeks uh, what a genuine philosopher spent his entire life building up to and then writing uh, is really rather laughable. Uh, but unfortunately, it's entirely common, uh, and this is what's going to lead Strauss to what I suggest is sort of his most important overall teaching in everything, uh, which is to say that the problem we all face is that people are simply too lazy when in their reading, uh, and that is one of those things that really gets people angry, uh, because when you have tenured professors uh, who are the ones actually offering these courses where they teach, for instance, the entirety of Kant's critique uh, of uh, the first critique, maybe the second, maybe the third, maybe hell, all three. Uh, they take umbrage to that and they would, they would, you know, they would say, like, look, it's not that difficult. You just need someone that knows how to explain it well. Uh, and Strauss was always of the opinion saying, no, uh, I think we might actually still have a lot to learn uh, because this is going to get into something that's, that's absolutely crucial uh, to Strauss, and he gives it a, a name. It's sort of a phrase, uh, and this, this in a sense, sort of defines the cave beneath the cave. Is uh, we have a pathos of progress. Uh, in other words, we have we we genuinely have in ourselves a passion for belief in progress. Uh, for Kant, for instance, says this explicitly. Uh, in the first critique, he says, uh, it should be no surprise uh, that we can now understand Plato better than Plato understood himself. I mean, sort of think about that, right? Uh, and then Heidegger is actually going to repeat that uh, in a, a very important commentary uh, on the Nicomachean ethics, which turns out to be two thirds of which is, wait, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Uh, he, Heidegger says that in a commentary on Plato's sophist, two thirds of which I think it's like four or 500 pages, two thirds of which is all about book six of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, right? Uh, so, so they're going to say these things. Uh, now, whether they believe them or not, uh, that's a different story uh, because it's all the difference in the, I mean, look, we, we, you never beat someone up over, you never beat a powerful thinker up over one line of text, right? Uh, so if, if Kant says something like, you know, we now know that we now know better than Plato knew himself. Uh, that should strike us as very shocking, uh, but at the same time, we should also have trust in the fact uh, that Kant was a powerful thinker. Uh, so let's sort of go with it, right? Uh, this is uh, sort of Straussian hermeneutics 101. Uh, Strauss was fond of saying that you have to believe that what the author is saying is true. That's the level of modesty that you yourself have to bring to the text. You have to just find a way within yourself to say, uh, okay, I'm picking this guy up and reading him, and I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. Uh, be sort of innocent until proven guilty, right? Uh, and now another way to rephrase uh, the, the meaning of the cave beneath the cave, this pathos of progress, is that we are under the uh, inversion of that. Uh, the people are guilty until proven innocent, right? Uh, that's the way that most people approach texts. Uh, they blow them up for the most part. Uh, they, they start reading uh, Plato's uh, Republic and they're just like, ah, yeah, you know, a couple thousand years ago, uh, ever heard of this thing called modern science? Uh, you know, something like that. 
Uh, and now today we've actually, uh, we've actually been able to dig a cave beneath the cave beneath the cave, because now we would point back and say, uh, he's white, <laughs> right? You know, Plato was white. Uh, so even more reasons uh, to sort of immediately question him uh, or dismiss him or something like that. Uh, so if I can just interject for one moment, I want to share with the people who are here from Appendix B, which is what uh, Joe's referring to. Strauss says about Kant that when he had the breakthrough that led to the critique of pure reason, quote, he needed 11 years not to write it, but just to think it. In other words, the tremendous intellectual effort, and I, you may have that in your notes, I just wanted to take the occasion to share it here, that that's what Strauss is getting us to deal with. You're not going to dismiss in 30 seconds something that it took Kant 11 years to think through. And when we can begin to appreciate the intellectual effort and the work that's happening, as it were, existentially among these thinkers, when they are breaking through to some insight that they're giving birth to over, you know, you could give birth to 10 kids in that period of time, and it took them uh, 10, 11 years to give birth to one great book. So we need to get off our high horse. Yeah, and I, 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 right? Go ahead. Yeah, I, I will actually one up you because uh, in the next paragraph, he says something even funnier. Uh, uh, he says, uh, uh, let's see, uh, certain fundamental insights of Kant, which today any jackass has or believes he has, uh, were refuted, right? Uh, refuted in quotation marks uh, with sovereign superiority uh, by jackasses among Kant's own contemporaries, right? Uh, so again, uh, Strauss, is, uh, Strauss certainly can be very critical, uh, but he's also very, very fair. Uh, and in fact, that's one of the things that makes Strauss so difficult to read. Uh, and you see, you'll see that in my notes because it's very difficult to uh, discern Strauss, uh, Strauss's own commentary from Strauss using the narrator's voice to present the argument uh, of the person that he's about to uh, sort of wrestle with, right? Uh, because that was what uh, another sort of key uh, hermeneutic of Straussian 101 uh, is he would always say that you have to error in the side of granting too much charity to the person that you're about to disagree with. Uh, he says, uh, and now this is coming from Nietzsche in a sense, uh, because uh, Nietzsche is going to call it intellectual honesty, uh, our newest virtue. Uh, the youngest virtue. Now, that in itself is also very important because uh, everyone today is going to be talking about intellectual honesty because uh, Nietzsche talks about it, says in, in many respects, that's our downfall. Uh, Strauss is going to compare that in a footnote, of course, <laughs> right, in a footnote. Uh, he's going to compare that to what he's going to refer to as the old love of truth, right? So there's all the difference in the world between simply saying that you're, I'm just being honest, right? Versus uh, an actual longing of your soul to really want to know the truth. And I think that that really gets to the matter more than anything, uh, because uh, there's a difference between people who simply want to understand uh, and someone, uh, the, the defining characteristic of the philosopher, which is to say uh, a deep eros to know the truth, right? Uh, now, that may sound like a difference in kind, I'm sorry, that may sound like a difference in degree, uh, it's going to turn out that that's a very much a difference in kind. Uh, so, okay, so, so that being said, um, what happens in the, in the very quickly, in, in rapid succession, this is so Strauss, uh, rapid succession with that second essay, uh, Appendix B, Religious Situation of the Present, uh, is he turns this question about uh, the religious situation in the present, it, he, he sort of, he rephrases it, and, and it's sort of like this cascade effect of different questions that it turns into. Um, and, and most importantly, what he points out there is that the religious situation of the present uh, can't really be distinguished from the intellectual situation of the present. I'm, so, I'm sorry, from the philosophical situation of the present. So it, it, he's, he's going to say that you can't really talk about the religious situation of the present without talking about the philosophical situation of the present. But he says the problem with that uh, is that I can't introduce a bunch of new terms, right? Because, uh, you know, then it's going to be complicated. And uh, one of the defining characteristics for Strauss of philosophy is being able to talk in the language of every man, right? 
uh, Plato was able to do an amazing amount of philosophy without introducing any neologisms. Uh, Nietzsche, by the way, did the same thing. Uh, he was able to accomplish amazing amounts of philosophy without introducing neologisms. Now, what Strauss says is that, and this is so funny because if you've read his later writings where he addresses this directly, you immediately see it. He says, okay, we can't separate the religious situation from the philosophical situation, so let's call that the intellectual situation. So it turns out that the present right now, us, which again is going to be the second, that's going to be the cave beneath the cave. Uh, that is going to get this name of intellectual. So intellectual is not to say philosophical. It's also not to say religious. It's to say a jumble uh, of the two uh, and a jumble in a way that it's very difficult to, to know which is which. Now, that's, that's very key because uh, uh, sort of, I, I don't want to spoil everything, but it's always important to know where we're going to end up and where we're at. He's going to talk about a cave beneath the cave. He's presently and immediately talking about a jumble uh, of things going on right now around us that are very hard to discern. Now that should already bring up images of another famous cave, right? Uh, where you don't necessarily know the difference between uh, the shadows, uh, the actual uh, uh, the phantasms, right? Uh, the, uh, it's hard for me sometimes to speak of these without resorting to the Greek. Uh, in the Greek, it's ikasia, uh, images uh, versus icons, uh, icones, uh, and then phantasms, right? The, the problem with an icon uh, is that it has no original that it corresponds to, right? It's not real. Uh, but an image itself, a phantasm, uh, might have something that corresponds to it in reality. And so these are, what's going, these are what are going to be very crucial uh, for understanding the cave and Strauss is going to bring those up at the very end really quickly. Uh, and if you blink, you'll miss it. Uh, but that's what's going on. So right away, you see that the essay itself appears to be a kind of uh, uh, the, the action of the essay, right? Strauss was famous for distinguishing between the argument and the action. Uh, it turns out that the argument, for instance, of a platonic dialogue cannot be separated from the action of the dialogue, too. The two of them go hand in hand. Uh, uh, they, they correlate with each other. It looks to be that this particular essay, uh, it's going to have an argument, but it's also going to have an action. And the action appears to be uh, a, an ascent out of a cave. Uh, so we're going to see uh, sort of uh, in real time as we read this essay, uh, how it is that one might get out of the cave. Uh, and we're going to find out we're actually in a a cave underneath the cave though. So that's sort of the, that's key too. Uh, well, if I so could just add one thing, if I could just add one thing about the, what you said about images and phantasms in Plato's cave. So those of you who are here and you just think about the situation of the cave dwellers, they don't know whether they see, first of all, they don't take the shadows as shadows. They don't know they are shadows of something, right? We know from the outside that they're shadows, but they don't know that they're shadows. They take the shadows as the things themselves, so to speak. But they don't distinguish between whether they're natural or artificial, whether they're natural or conventional. That's another part of the jumble, right? They don't have the distinctions that are necessary for the philosophical ascent. Okay, so that's just adding on what you said about image and phantasm. Just wanted yeah. to add to that the natural and the conventional, the natural and the artificial. For them, it all appears as one soup, you know, one shadow soup. I, I, like, I like that soup. Uh, I like that better than my jumble. Uh, uh, and, and I would simply add, uh, uh, for those who, who are involved in, uh, you know, studying uh, Plato's Republic, uh, I do always encourage people to at least take a look at what the key Greek terms might be, because uh, they're going to be very important. So it is important to know when you see, for instance, in a translation, the word image uh, versus, for instance, uh, a shadow, right? Uh, these are going to be very key. Uh, you know, not to get too bogged down in the academic stuff, but those I can promise you, I, I promise you, it will be worth your time because it's going to open a whole new layer uh, to understanding things that you would never have found in the translation. Uh, but, but if you have someone like Bloom, uh, and certainly if you have someone like Michael guiding you, uh, he's going to point those things out. And I know this because he pointed some of them out to me, uh, for instance, with uh, the word science uh, and theology. Uh, in, in the Republic. Uh, it's always important. Who says them first? 
uh, and where do they occur, uh, the context. Uh, but, but okay, so uh, what, what Strauss is going to argue immediately about this soup, uh, this jumble, uh, is that it's, uh, now uh, Yaffe's being sly here, uh, okay. Uh, he puts it in a footnote. Uh, th the word that's being translated from the German could also mean inauthentic. Uh, the, the, the situation uh, of the present is that it is uh, inauthentic if we try to situate it itself, right? Because uh, Strauss is going to argue, for instance, uh, that the, the intellect cannot be situated. Uh, the intellect is not something that you sort of locate in time. Uh, the intellect is sort of its, its own thing. Now, it is, uh, it is affected by temporality, uh, but to sort of think of it as something sort of uh, just existing in the moment uh, is going to be uh, problematic. Um, but again, I want to say uh, when he says uh, that, so he says, uh, si in other words, si to situate something is, is to sort of understand it as inauthentic. Now, anyone who's read Heidegger is going to know that that is a, a red flag should go up, say, all right, pause, uh, wait a minute. Uh, Strauss, you might be playing funny with us. Uh, you're being wily, uh, but that's just something to sort of keep an eye on, right? I always tell people just, you know, whenever I post pictures of my books, they always, they, some people even make fun of me because of all the little stickies that I have. And yes, uh, they are in fact color-coded uh, because they need to be color-coded because some things uh, just pop up. And I'm like, I'm like that, that little fella might come important uh, later. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep my eye on you. Uh, and so that's sort of like a blue, not necessarily a, a neon green. Uh, so that's something to keep an eye on with the, the term inauthentic. Uh, so what he says is that uh, situating for it uh, in, order, in order for it to not be inauthentic, which is to say authentic, right, more genuine, uh, it has to become questioning. Uh, now, this is what's going to be key, because remember, uh, what's going to happen ultimately is that uh, the, situ the problem of the present uh, is that we have a pathos uh, for progress. We, 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 we genuinely want to believe uh, with a passion, right? That's key. We want to believe with a passion uh, that we are, uh, in many respects, if not all respects, better uh, than our predecessors uh, with respect to thought, right? Uh, and, and that's what Strauss is going to try to get us to really question, uh, to make question worthy. Uh, so how do you do that? Uh, well, now he's going to go through, uh, and this is so beautiful. Uh, Strauss does something that I didn't even know existed uh, prior to this. Uh, we're talking, obviously, about the image, uh, the most famous image in Strauss, which is the cave beneath the cave. Uh, but I would argue that what he's about to do is even more uh, astonishing. Uh, he anthropomorphizes the present uh, I mean, let's just sort of think about what he's doing. He, he turns the present, and this is, this is actually worthy of note. He turns the present into a goddess, right? Uh, so, so that should be another sort of red flag. Uh, in other words, this moment, this present that we are in uh, exists as a kind of divine thing for us, right? Uh, and that could be very problematic because what if the gods we're worshiping uh, aren't real? Uh, or at least aren't worthy of the, the worship and the piety that we give them, whatever that may be. Uh, I'm speaking metaphorically, of course. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sort of parroting Nietzsche over here saying, God's dead, uh, you foolish believers. That's not what I'm saying. I'm speaking directly about the imagery that's being used here. Um, now, uh, what he's going to do uh, immediately is sort of, before he presents that image, he does a name drop. Uh, and, and this is something also to keep in mind with Nietzsche. Anytime, anytime a top-rate philosopher mentions another thinker, take note, uh, because Strauss is about to mention Maimonides. Uh, now, that's going to be very, very crucial. Uh, uh, one particularly astute commentator uh, of Strauss refers to these years in the 30s uh, as Strauss's uh, Farabian turn right? Uh, because Farabi, Al-Farabi is going to be decisive uh, for Strauss to really find his legs uh, in this uh, project that he's got going on of sort of understanding, uh, well, the entire tradition. Uh, so, so he's going to mention Maimonides. 
And the key phrase that he says when he's introducing Maimonides is he says, in another age, right? So, so wait a minute. Uh, let's think about this. Strauss has just injected temporality, right? He just told us, he, ju he just finished telling us that the intellect, right? The intellect is not uh, defined necessarily by temporality. And now he's going to sort of, he, he does this double back where he brings up temporality with regard to Maimonides. Uh, so again, sort of throw a flag up, put a bookmark down, say, okay, something interesting is going on here. Uh, need to be more attentive. Uh, and what he does with Maimonides in that one paragraph, what he does with Maimonides is he turns, he's already turned the religious situation of the present into a question of, of we need to somehow find a way to question this, which he rephrases as uh, the, the, the intellectual question of the present. Remember uh, the jumble, the soup, uh, the soup of religious philosophy, <laughs> right? Uh, well, now he's going to turn that into uh, the, he's going to sort of claim, and this is in rapid fire succession. So you might, a lot of times I get lost in this stuff and I say, okay, I don't really know how he got there, but I've got to follow this. I got to follow it through uh, and I'll just double back eventually. And if I don't understand it along the way, I'll come back and re-examine. Uh, but he says uh, the question of the question, the question of the present becomes uh, the, the question simply, right? The question, right? Capital T-H-E. Uh, that's the question, right? Uh, what is the right life? That's what, that's what the, the, the religious question of the present turns into the intellectual question of the present, uh, which turns into the question, which turns into the question of the right life. Now, uh, for those who aren't necessarily very familiar with Plato, uh, that is the question. Uh, that is, there's, you know, you'll always hear people talk about the forms, this sort of thing, sure, uh, they have a place, they have a very important place. But at the end of the day, uh, even in the Republic itself, right, because the forms, usually people get it from the Republic. But what was the question that led to the forms, right? They wanted to know if living the just life was worth it, right? They wanted to know about the right life, right? What's the right life, Socrates? Uh, because remember, uh, it's either Polymarchus or Glaucon, I forget which one, maybe even Adiamantus. He says, uh, these people have talked our ears off, right? I mean, literally, that's the Greek. They've talked our ears off uh, about, you know, the fact that, you know, uh, justice is sort of just a, uh, well, let's, let me rephrase it because they're speaking of the sophists, right? Uh, if someone were to ask me what sophistry is, I would say the best way to define sophistry is that uh, everything is simply logos, right? Uh, in other words, uh, it's all just a matter of words, baby. It's just words, right? You, you know, and, and I mean, think about it when you start heckling people about the words they use, like, well, hold on, you said, you know, or, or let's think about relationship rise, right? I don't mean to be crass, but some people will say, uh, oh, there it is, uh, Publius sends us the Greek. <laughs> I love you, Publius. Uh, Th let's let's think about it in the way that we all would experience it and i don't mean to be crass but a lot of times this is helpful because uh, in a sort of heideggerian sense we need to be jarred out of uh our stiltedness sometimes uh let's just think about some things that people say uh you know you're acting like a bitch uh you're calling me a bitch no 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 says you're acting like one i didn't say you're one hello sophistry <laughs> right uh it's all just words right that's what, that's what a good uh, way to understand sophistry would be. It's a way to play with words and sort of haggle out of situations uh, which you might otherwise be committed to making, well, a commitment. Um, and that's, what, uh, that's going to be exactly what is not the teaching of Plato or Strauss. Uh, so, okay, now- uh, just, so one, just one minute, Joe. Sorry if I can come in here really yeah. quickly on one point. Yeah, so. Cool. Those of you who haven't had a chance to read Plato's Sophist, you should definitely do that and you'll see the Sophist escaping in his words, always into non-being as opposed to in the direction of being, always escaping into the shadows instead of into the direction of the light as it were. So you get some great images out of Plato's Sophist on that type of operation. And that's one thing. Then the other thing, I don't know if this is appropriate to say, but I'm going to anyways. 
Well, you know what? Let, let me wait. Let me wait. Because you made such a beautiful point about how Strauss is driving us from the concern with the present to the concern with the, as it were, always present question yeah. of how to live. And without me having to give examples, you can just see what are the disputes that the today's news were discussing. You know, someone took a side on this question, someone took a side on that question. And if they thought through their taking of sides, they would be driven well past that particular issue to the more fundamental question. Well, what kind of world do we want to live in in the first place? What kind of society do we want to live in? What's right and wrong? What are our basic rights, responsibilities and obligations towards one another, right? So starting with the affairs of the day, we're driven if we seriously question, Strauss says, to the timeless questions, as it were. It's just a beautiful, beautiful point. And you're right, it makes it so quickly, but so powerfully. Yeah, and, and one thing I, I would just sort of add to that, and I'm not taking a side on this, uh, I'm just sort of adding it as an example to really jar us into understanding what was just said by Michael that's very crucial. Uh, I always tell people, uh, if you're gonna take a position, you damn well better think about what the ultimate logical conclusion is, okay? Because uh, that's going to happen, right? That's why we call it logic, right? <laughs> because it's going to happen. Uh, so for instance, uh, I'll try to take something that's not entirely controversial, which is impossible today because everything's controversial. Uh, but think about something like universal health care. Uh, a lot of times people that when you ask them why they're in support of that, and again, I'm not taking a stance. I'm just sort of pointing out a, a, a situation I've seen. Uh, a lot of times if you ask someone, well, why are you in favor of universal health care? Uh, and those, it, you, you might end up arguing with them and they'll finally just end up saying something like, well, I just think that everyone should have health care. I guess that makes me a bad person. Well, no, uh, that's not it at all. Uh, we need to think about the logical conclusion. Uh, can the country afford everyone having universal health care? Or he stalled there. Did everybody else stall? Is it me? Yes, he stalled. Okay, so let's give him a minute to, uh, to come back. <laughs> uh, Joe writing here, Wi-Fi in the desert, sad face should be good if reboot. So we'll let him do that. And let me just read to you the passage that he was referring to. So this is Appendix B, page 227, if you have the volume or the PDF. And this is now Strauss clarifying the issue with talking about the present. So as Joe had said, he moved from the religious situation of the present to the intellectual situation of the present, and from the intellectual situation to the question of the present. And now in order to drop or X out the present from this equation or from this formulation, here's what he says. Let us imagine in a fanciful manner, a Kadima camp assembly in the 12th century. Remember he's addressing Jewish students. So he has them imagine a Jewish situation in the century of Rabbi Moses Ben Maimon, that is Maimonides. And that you had asked a student of the Rambam, which is how he's called by his acronym in uh, the Jewish circles. You would ask the student of the Rambam to speak to you so that he might help you by means of what he has learned from his teacher to free yourselves from your confusion and perplexity. All right, so you're talking to a student of the Rambam who wrote the Guide of the Perplexed back there on the wall, and you ask him, what did you learn from Maimonides to help you in your confusion and perplexity? What would he have spoken to you about, Strauss asks? Creation, providence, the unity of reason and revelation. Hence about substantive questions. In another age, that passage Joe brought our attention to that phrase, in another age, one would probably have spoken about other questions, but always about substantive questions. Nobody would have minded whether or not they were questions of the present. At the time, they were questions of the present that were being dealt with, but they were not being dealt with as questions of the present. When we question, Strauss continues, seriously question, we then by that very fact ask questions of the present. You see, the fact, when we say the present, we don't just mean what's contemporary, what's going on. It's our concern here and now with issues that transcend our here and now, that are rooted in something deeper than our here and now, but that still concern us. If we pose, he continues, the italicized question, that we are certain is the question, then we are asking the question of the present. We will therefore cross out of the present in the formulation, the question of the present, and say the question. There can, however, be no doubt about what the question is, that is and must be the most important one for us. We saw in Greek, thank you to Publius for messaging it. The question 
is what is the right life? How should I live? What matters? What is needful? Thus, our modern topic of the religious situation of the present boils down to the old eternal question, the primordial question. How do I live? What's the right way of life? What's the one thing needful? Now, I don't know exactly where Joe's going to take us next when he comes back here, and you should continue to post questions and comments in the chat, but I want to take an occasion here to set Strauss apart on the question of the right way of life from another figure who's important to him in this period, Carl Schmitt. So some of you probably know Carl Schmitt, most famously concept of the political, not his only text, but somehow is most famous and maybe most topical for us to a certain extent. And Strauss in his notes on Carl Schmitt's concept of the political says that whereas Schmitt wanted to defend enmity as a way of asserting the seriousness of a political life, in the face of what seemed to be like the trivializing of human existence through its pacification. Strauss says the problem with Schmitt's uh, enmity is that it's formal. So long as you are willing to kill or die for your belief, you're welcome in Schmitt's estimation. And if you are not, then you are, you know, low in his eyes independently of the content of your commitment, as it were, or the substantive um, X that you're willing to live or die for. And Strauss in his commentary says, no, the genuine impulse that makes friends and enemies into groupings is disagreement over the question of the right way of life, the substantive issue. Because Schmidt did not pay attention in Strauss's reading to the substantive issues over which we form friendships and enmities, he is as liberal as the liberals. They're formal in tolerating peaceful alternatives, and he's formal in tolerating, uh, you know, martial alternatives. But they both err because neither one of them is oriented towards the question, the substantive question of the right way of life. All right, so there you go. That was a little... A placeholder now that Joe's back with us. I believe he is. Let's see. Can yes. you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yes. Can you see me? No. I can't see myself either. See your name. <laughs> Wonderful. Is your Hello, camera? Uh, you know what? I think I can. Uh, did that do something? Did that make a prompt for you to turn your camera on? There we go. Oh. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're back. So. Uh, yes, uh, that name, that is not me, by the way. Uh, I don't know who that person is. Uh, I'm sure he's a fine man. Uh, it's just not me. Uh, and by the way, don't bother Googling. Uh, it's all lies. Okay, so uh, uh, apologies uh, if you actually heard me screaming all the way from the desert. Uh, the the Wi-Fi out here does this sometimes. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, the sunsets are great. Sunrises are great. Single cloud in the sky. Uh, no Wi-Fi. Uh, scorpions he, chewing on the cable sorry for a horrible dad joke that yeah. doesn't even make sense yeah so so this gives me more resolve to just sort of give away the goods while i can still at least talk right because i have no no idea when this is going to die on me or not uh so, so okay so let me just sort of jump ahead uh now now keep in mind he does call uh, what, what i've been referring to here is this well strauss uses the phrase uh the the pathos for progress uh strauss are we there? Okay. Uh, I just sort of. I just had to turn my camera off for a minute. Sorry. Oh, continue. Oh, I'll okay. Yeah. I just saw this. I saw this handsome man. Uh, all of a sudden, I was like, "Wait, that's not me." Uh, oh, there he is. <laughs> that that is. Uh, I like to think of that uh, movie, Pretty Woman, uh, where Richard Gere says that uh, he tells the 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 guy that runs the story says, he says, "We need. I need a lot more fawning." Uh, and, and he says, well, uh, okay, uh, not only are you a handsome man, uh, but I could tell from the moment you walked in the room that you were uh, to be reckoned with. Uh, and that's sort of, I see that picture uh, of Millerman and I say Millermania. Uh, okay, so, uh, all right. So uh, what, what I've been referring to, uh, what Strauss calls uh, the, the pathos of progress, right? We have this passion to really believe in progress. Uh, he actually says, uh, he, he calls it a tyrannical conviction. 
Okay. Uh, now remember, uh, he's going to uh, do a translation of a little Xenophon dialogue uh, called On Tyranny. Uh, now that's going to be in 1948, and we're we're here in 1932. Uh, but again, all of these sort of things are coming up. They're sort of bubbling to the surface, and Strauss is becoming Strauss uh, because one could say, uh, in fact, it has been said, uh, and I think possibly by Strauss himself. Uh, that the correspondence between he and Kojev uh, is really uh, about on tyranny, but it's about on tyranny of the present. Uh, and so again, we've got all of these elements that are sort of coming together uh, with regard to the present uh, and ancient philosophy uh, and, and sort of uh, all of these things. Uh, now, uh, let me just sort of jump ahead because uh, he says, he says, let's Let's, uh, he keeps saying that we need to, to learn to ask questions naively, right? Because apparently we're not able to be naive enough. That's going to be the problem is that uh, we're not naive uh, because we think we already know things. Um, so he says, he says the way that we need to uh, question, uh, the, the question concerning the right life, he says it has to be posed, uh, and he uses these two words, unselfconsciously, uh, and naively. Anyone who studied even a modicum uh, of, of postmodern philosophy realizes that these things, uh, to be unselfconscious, uh, to be naive, uh, they're going to be the most difficult things to attain. And remember, uh, Strauss has already hinted in this essay that the, the actual action uh, is going to be sort of climbing and getting out of the cave. Uh, so we're going to find out just, uh, so, so Strauss is on board. He, right. He's, he's toying with us in a sense, right. He's saying that, you know, oh, you know, just, just, we need to be a little more unselfconscious, just, you know, a, a little naive. Uh, but he knows damn well, uh, that climbing out of the cave is, is the most difficult thing, uh, that's possible, uh, period. Uh, so, okay. Uh, now he says, uh, that, and this is where the real image comes in, right. Uh, the divine present uh, is a goddess, uh, and he says that she speaks to us haughtily, uh, ha haughtily knowing and exalted, right? Uh, well, how does that happen? Uh, well, that's because, in a sense, that's a mirror of ourselves uh, talking to us attempting to be uh, unselfconscious and naive, uh, I would submit for your consideration. Uh, now, I don't want to go into the speech because uh, he, he, it's very long. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a significant page of text, uh, and it's just unbelievably rich. Uh, but here's the important point. Uh, he, he, he intro as he's introducing uh, the, the, the moment, right, let us actually be very provocative. We could call it the Augenblick, right? Uh, I mean, I seem to recall uh, something in Nietzsche the, about the Augenblick uh, that's rather important. Uh, but here's, here's the thing. Uh, he introduces the moment to us as haughtily knowing and exalted. And then uh, he's going to, uh, he's, he gives the speech and then he immediately re-describes uh, that in the following terms. And I think this is extremely relevant for all of us with contemporary debates. Uh, I mean, literally right now. Uh, he says, uh, that's what's being said to us uh, through the mouth of the most agile, most progressive, most expert, uh, most lively uh, children of our time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you our present. <laughs> uh, what we are uh, hearing, the yapping of mouths uh, incessantly that never stops. Uh, Strauss was very far ahead of the curve on that. Uh, now, uh, what he says then, and this is why I feel like I can jump over uh, that speech without really even saying anything about it, because he says, uh, we need to hear this more clearly. Uh, the thoughtful person, right, uh, seeking to discern truth and untruth, and as he says, uh, to do justice to all, right, needs a synthesis. Now, again, is this Strauss speaking or is this uh, Strauss giving the narrator's voice uh, to our, uh, our initial response, right? Because I think that's going to be key uh, because uh, I'll, I'll just let it out of the bag. Uh, Strauss is going to, in this essay, but in particular, the next essay, the intellectual uh, moment of the present, 
uh, he's going to really criticize a synthesis. Uh, in fact, he's going to say that most people, what they call a synthesis is actually just a compromise. Uh, now, let's sort of pause for a moment. What might be the greatest synthesis uh, that's of concern to Strauss? Uh, maybe Jerusalem and Athens, <laughs> right? Uh, maybe uh, sort of uh, the theological political problem itself, right? Uh, one might even say, uh, uh, Josh Perrins uh, says this very well in uh, one of his books on Strauss. Uh, he says that uh, one way to think of the Western tradition itself uh, in philosophy uh, is a series of different attempts to form syntheses, right? Uh, think about the opening question of Thomas's Summa, right? Uh, nature and grace. Uh, it turns out they're not in conflict. They actually uh, uh, supplement each other, right? Uh, one could call that a synthesis. Uh, let's think about, for instance, uh, well, modern science itself. Uh, that's a kind of synthesis, right? Uh, we call that synthesis humanitarianism. Uh, this is uh, Bacon, right? Not the good kind, but well, actually the better kind, uh, Francis Bacon. Uh, this is Bacon putting uh, new, new wine in old bottles, right? Uh, Bacon's actually explicit about that. That's how you corrupt virtues. Uh, well, I don't want to say corrupt. That's how you initiate change, uh, is the kind of Trojan horse attack. Well, what that's going to bring about is this, this great thing that we call humanitarianism, uh, which is actually quite imperialistic, uh, very imperialistic with global, uh, uh desires, uh, in fact. Uh, and all of that is there. And so one could sort of say that's a synthesis. And then of course, you're going to have Hegel uh, in the mix, right? Uh, but really Kant is doing this as well. Uh, Kant is actually doing, uh, so, so Rousseau is the first one to come along and say, uh, now uh, I think Rousseau is probably too deep of a thinker. That, that's the great error in Rousseau is he was simply too, too great of a thinker uh, because he's so easily misunderstood. Uh, he's understood as a moralizer, but in fact, uh, he's very, very pessimistic, very extremely pessimistic. Uh, and so he doesn't see this, the, he, he actually digs under the roots of the modern project and finds a deeper problem. Uh, you know, Locke can say that, you know, if you sort of scratch the veneer of, we call it civilization to be civil, uh, if you sort of scratch the, vene the veneer of that underneath it, you already find the state of nature, which is war. Uh, well, Rousseau is going to take it even further and say, turns out reason itself is the problem. Now, Kant couldn't abide that. Uh, Kant absolutely, Kant had these, uh, he has his uh, Humean turn, right? Uh, but he also credits Rousseau uh, very strongly for a turn. Reading Emile really sort of also woke uh, Kant up. And that's what Kant wants to synthesize, right? I mean, with Kant, we get the, trend, right, the, 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 the synthesis, right? Uh, and what it is, is it's the ability now, uh, because we're going to give, uh, we're going to dump nature altogether uh, and find a way uh, to somehow make man at home in the world. That's going to be the ultimate synthesis, to make man at home in the world. Uh, and he's going to find a way to synthesize these things, uh, which Rousseau found so problematic. And then Hegel's going to do it. Uh, it, but you see what I'm saying. I, I don't want to turn this into a talk. Uh, Joe, just one second. Let me interject again for a moment. Fantastic and hugely important points about the synthesis. So you see examples of both modern and pre-modern synthesis in what Joe is presenting. All right. And Strauss, a couple of things I just want to say here quickly. He is always pulling apart for us the synthesis and giving it to us as a stark either or city and man philosophy and law jerusalem and athens reason and revelation now joe when you were dealing with the desert wi-fi i quickly said a few things about strauss's commentary on schmidt's concept of the political and right at the end of strauss's notes on schmidt's concept of the political he talks about this same issue about the removing of the triad the synthesizing third getting it out of the way and restoring the dyad that gives us the genuine conflictual position. So what Joe is telling us here about synthesis on one hand versus a real distinction on the other, it's hugely important for Strauss 
throughout many writings, as I tried to indicate by just going through titles for you, where he sets out that. And really, he believes that we are implicated in that division and take one side or the other. And any attempt at a third is a is a uh, unbending of the bow. You know, it's sort of like not facing up to the real problem. All right. So something crucial, crucially, crucially important that Joe is walking us through now. Yeah, I mean, and, and even, for instance, uh, natural right and history, right? There's another one there. Uh, now, I would simply say, because uh, I know that we have uh, really someone, uh, again, uh, I, you know, I have such great respect for many people here. Uh, everyone knows I love Michael, uh, but we do have Justin with us. Justin knows this inside and out. When we're, we're Ultimately, what it's going to come down to uh, for one of Strauss's most, well, for, for his best friend, Jacob Klein, uh, and also for one of his arguably best students uh, is going to be this thing called an indeterminate dyad, which is to say you have two things and you think that you can separate them, but it turns out that every time you try to separate them, somehow they end up getting, uh, the other one ends up popping back up again. Uh, I like to think of some of these computer generated graphics where it's like something that's just sort of in blooming and, and coming out of that. Uh, so that's not to say that that is a synthesis that is an indeterminate dyad because it is a kind of unity but it's also a kind of separation and that's going to be the most important problem uh mathematically speaking in all of plato uh not the nuptial number uh not the lottery from the laws right 5040 uh not these things uh socrates tells us explicitly he says the the one problem of everything that stopped me dead in my tracks uh, and uh, brace yourself, uh, is uh, how is it that one plus one equals two and two equals one plus one, right? Uh, because remember, uh, think of it this way. You have a one and a one, and then you have a two, right? But a two is also a one. It's one in itself, right? So, so, so you know, obviously uh, Socrates is sort of uh, playing with us, but he's also being very serious uh, because in the grand scheme of things, you can think about these things in terms of the virtues, right? Because when you're reading a platonic dialogue, say for instance, uh, you know, any topic at all could come up. It could be two wrestlers talking about cosmology and somehow, or, or, or somehow it turns into a discussion of courage. And then that somehow a discussion of courage, it turns out that courage is wisdom, right? It, it's, it's like, how does this happen, right? Uh, and that's, that's sort of the nature of the indeterminate dyad that we're dealing with. And I would simply say, uh, again, uh, you know, Seth Benedetti writes this amazing review of City and Man, uh, and in some discussions elsewhere, he talks about how he uh, mentioned this indeterminate dyad to Strauss, and then he sort of hints at the fact that maybe Strauss might have used that as his way of writing City and Man, right? Because remember, you're dealing with three chapters, City and Man's three chapters, uh, so you've got sort of the the the, the the tertiary, right? And so you have to ask yourself, well, what's going on here? Where, where I sort of left off is Strauss presents this divine moment of the present speaking to us in these sort of uh, very haughty ways and prideful ways. Uh, and then he's going to say, okay, let's, let's hear it more clearly. And so what I would suggest to you is that the rest of the essay is actually a clarification of everything that was just said anthropomorphically, but now he's going to give it philosophical content, okay? So it's really sort of the same essay, right? As the, as the, as the speech. And you just sort of have to map things onto each other. Um, but I'm not going to be doing that. Uh, Strauss, Strauss says, uh, he speaks of uh, the incredible difficulty of a synthesis. And now he talks about this word conspectivism. Now, that's what the entire first essay is about, conspectivism. And, the funny thing about Strauss is that oftentimes he'll define these key words for you and then he'll double back and he'll say, oh, by the way, that's another way to define it. You know, so we get these multiple iterations of things. Uh, and so he's going to define conspectivism in the first essay. He's actually going to define it in the second essay. And then he's going to define it even more in the third essay. But let me just sort of say this about conspectivism. Uh, for those of you who either haven't read the essay yet or just want to know what I think about it. Um, I mean, I can give you page numbers, but uh, this, this is sort of how he presents it in the essay. Uh, he says, conspectivism uh, is the complete absence of a concrete notion uh, of the emergence of a position. Okay, 
uh, I don't like that because uh, right away I'm sort of like, I don't know what the hell you mean, man. Uh, so uh, what I would simply say uh, is that I think that Strauss has a very specific meaning with this word conspectivism. Now, I don't know, again, I don't know if he coins it, uh, but he certainly does make it his own. So the first thing that I did was I sort of, I looked at what he was saying because conspectivism has to do with, uh, he said, he's speaking of the totality of all the, uh, he, he calls them variously, uh, let's see, uh, he calls them positions, uh, he calls them standpoints, uh, and so what I start to think of is I'm like, well, well, that's just Nietzsche's perspectivism, right? That's what we mean when we say things like worldview. Uh, and so what I think conspectivism is, is uh, in one sense, and I get this from Heidegger, Heidegger has a lot of fun with the word concrete. Uh, he actually points to the Latin say, saying, he says, you know, concrete comes from concrescence, which means uh, to grow with right? Uh, so in one sense, you have the, the con part of conspectivism, which is a kind of way sort of to grow with uh, or with. Uh, and then the uh, spectivism, which I think is just sort of perspectives, right? That's sort of the Nietzschean perspectives. And so I think what he's referring to with conspectivism is just the totality of all of these things that we refer to as worldviews, perspectives, right? Nietzsche always says that he has a uh, He's a master, he's like a spider with a, th a thousand eyes and can see from all these different perspectives, can see around corners for God's sakes. Uh, and so uh, I think that's what's going on. And so this is the key with conspectivism and why it's problematic. Uh, he's, going to, he's going to sort of run down this kind of conspectivism, but then he's going to say, you know, uh, there's really two kinds of readers. Uh, and now this is crucial, right? Because uh, Remember, Strauss learns an awful lot from Nietzsche, an awful lot from Nietzsche. He gets his hermeneutic from Nietzsche, right? Uh, Strauss didn't invent, uh, you know, assuming that what you're reading is true. Nietzsche actually says it. In fact, Nietzsche says it explicitly a couple different times uh, in a couple different ways. Uh, it's one of the ways that he says we need to learn how to love again. Uh, we need to learn how to be charitable to books. Uh, we need to actually love the book uh, and before we can sort of lead it by the nose. Uh, Heidegger actually says sort of the same thing, right? Heidegger is known for doing violence to the text. Uh, but of course, Heidegger doesn't say just run off and do violence to the text. He says, study Aristotle for about 20 years first, uh, and then, you know, have fun with your TNT. Um, but, but the point about conspectivism is that it, it, it's a way of understanding the two kinds of readers that, that Strauss is going to point out. He says, you're going to have the people who just dismiss books. Uh, everyone knows them. Hell, you see them on Twitter. <laughs> I've actually seen them on Twitter about some friends of mine's books. Uh, they say, I don't need to read it. Uh, you know, I already know that man's, you know, a, a fascist or something like that, right? I can't, I mean, literally they say, I can't possibly imagine learning anything from that book, so I don't even need to read it. Uh, okay, uh, well, Strauss understood you better than you understand yourself. And in fact, he called you narrow-minded, uh, which everyone already knows you are. Uh, uh, he says of these people, they have uh, fixed and ready opinions, right? Uh, one of the ways that I like to think about this is, you know, when you're talking with people, you can always tell if they're listening to you or they're just waiting to say what they have to say, right? You know, it's like, are you listening to me? Uh, or are you sort of stammering the whole time? Like, ah, 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 right, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, that's the narrow-minded reader. That's one reader. Uh, Strauss says of those, they're innocuous. No need to even worry about them. No, no, don't bother with them, uh, which I, I wish I had read this about a year ago because I, I went to great war with a few people like that. Uh, and uh, I think it's fair to say I besmirched myself in front of the world uh, going to war with these people. Uh, I didn't know Nietzsche's lesson, right? Nietzsche says, uh, pick your enemies that are worthy. Uh, don't just go to war with anybody. Um, but then he says there's another kind of reader. And this, this is the more important reader. In fact, he says this is the dangerous reader. I mean, if Strauss is saying someone's dangerous, and they're a reader, right? Strauss was a hell of a reader. Uh, and of course, you know, he understood danger. I mean, come on, uh, Nazi Germany. Uh, he calls these people the stimulated readers. And the reason they're dangerous is precisely because they're not narrow-minded. They're not narrow-minded. But they go, to a, they go to an extreme 
right? Because pay, pay very close attention to the language that Strauss uses. He says the stimulated reader is dangerous because he's open to every new opinion, right? It's not just that he's open-minded. He's open to all of them, to everything. That's going to be problematic uh, because one way to think of that, that we all have seen in academia, uh, well, hell, we see it in real life. Uh, people become very prone to, to fashion, to trends, right? Uh, I often think that many universities, most universities wouldn't even have a philosophy department if postmodernism wasn't around uh, because that's the cat's meow, right? Uh, everyone's a postmodern in a sense. Well, I mean, and to be fair, Strauss was a postmodern. He was just a postmodern Plato. Uh, Heidegger was a postmodern, but he was just a postmodern, well, uh, Michael, you're cute. Uh, and then uh, Nietzsche was a postmodern, uh, but he was just sort of a postmodern, uh, I would actually say Nietzsche was a postmodern Plato, but he, he, that's a whole different conversation. But, but in any case, uh, actually that's Justin's cue. <laughs> but but uh, in any case, uh, the problem is that they're open to everything. Uh, and then what they do immediately, this is the tyrannical, uh, this is where the, the, the sort of the tyranny of the, the tyranny of the present washes in, right? Uh, they're dangerous precisely because they're open to every view. And then what do they do? What do they do? Uh, Strauss says uh, they write a book or a pamphlet uh, or an essay uh, be, uh, about all of the present uh, understandings of things, all of the present perspectives. Uh, that's the hallmark of conspectivism. Now, remember, he's talking about us right now. That's our hallmark, is that we want to understand, we, we want to get a good lay of the land, right? Uh, this is sort of, uh, and, I, and I'm not bashing Copleston, but I'm just saying this is sort of uh, what we see there, right? Uh, someone who's going to provide us an entire history of philosophy, all thought, everything, uh, nicely summarized, uh, 11 volumes, uh, maybe more, depending on if you accept the ones that after he passed and they put them together. Uh, but everyone does this. I'm not seeing, I'm not, I'm not, I'm certainly not mocking Copleston, right? I've, I've read Copleston. It's, it's important to read him. I'm just saying that that's sort of where we get these textbook histories. Uh, that's the reason we have the textbook histories. That's the reason we have courses in philosophy with book lists that are ridiculous, right? Uh, motorcycle tour through the Louvre, anyone? right? Uh, there go the Impressionists, right? There goes Kant. Uh, there goes Hegel. A uh, little bit of Plato. Uh, no worries, but you understand them enough. Uh, you've made it through the motorcycle tour of philosophy. Uh, here's your PhD. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, we're just going to give you these things called comps, uh, where it means that you have comprehensively understood everything. Uh, and then it's just a formality. But of course, you know, you have to understand everything uh, sufficiently. Uh, we stamp it. There's your PhD. Uh, hello, you're a philosopher. Uh, that's what Strauss is going against, radically against, uh, and I think rightfully so. Um, what he says of the conspectivist, he calls it the conspectivist spirit, right? Uh, is that it's the lazy reader turned writer, right? Uh, one of the things I love to think about with this is I like to bring up uh, I, I think it was uh, Ambrose, uh, St. Ambrose. Uh, one of the things about Ambrose that put him at odds with his professors was he was a very gifted student. And what he started doing was after he would take a course with a, a, at a university course, he would turn right back around the next semester and offer his own course on it, right? Uh, I mean, th th think about that for a moment, those of you who have studied at the, the philosophy of the education level, right? Uh, imagine you take a course on Plato's Republic as an undergrad or even as a graduate student, and then the very next semester you turn around and offer your own course on it. Right? Uh, it's funny because we actually see that in spaces, right? Uh, I, you know, I'll offer a space or someone will offer a space on a subject, uh, and then some other person will turn around and offer their own space on it and say, you know, I just want to correct a bunch of that I heard, you know, in this previous space because they're leading people astray, you know, and they're, you know, they're mad or whatever. Uh, and it's so funny because, uh, you know, nothing new under the sun, right, uh, from Ambrose to us. Uh, and I'm sure probably way back with the pre-Socratics uh, ever heard of, uh, I don't know, uh, Parmenides, right? He was the one who read Parmenides and then turned around and offered his own theory, right? I'm joking, but it's essentially something like that. Uh, now, 
uh, I'm sort of coming to my, my end. I know I've been rambling and rambling and rambling, uh, but uh, the totality of the positions, right? The perspectives, they, they, they then want to write a pamphlet. One could even call it a dissertation, right? <laughs> right, uh, they've passed comps uh, and now they're going to contribute something to the field of scholarship, right? Uh, they're the lazy reader turned writer now, uh, again, I, want, I do want to emphasize something crucial here. Uh, I do think that when Strauss talks about lazy readers, that's fundamental uh, because a lot of this is going to be coming up in persecution in the art of writing. It's no coincidence, by the way, that the first publication uh, that Strauss himself made of the cave beneath the cave comes up in persecution in the art of writing. And look where it comes up. It comes up in his chapter on Spinoza, okay? Now, again, this is getting back to what I was saying, Spinoza's critique of religion, Strauss's first book, very, very crucial, but seldom read anymore. I mean, Strauss even called it, Strauss himself called it a disappointment or, or something even more disgusting or something like that. But again, that's a mature scholar looking back on his early work. Uh, so that may be not quite fair. Uh, but again, so all of this is sort of coming together, right? Um, now, uh, the problem with these, uh, we could call them scribblers, uh, is that uh, you know, they want to synthesize everything and offer their theory uh, to the world. Uh, now, there, I would say there are cases of people who have successfully done that. I'm not, I'm not saying you can't do that. I'm not saying that's not possible. Uh, I just want to point out that uh, Strauss, what Strauss is saying is that it's become too common, uh, all too common. And in fact, it's become revolutionarily, is that a word? It's become so common uh, in a kind of revolutionary way. Now, uh, what they're doing with these things is offering a synthesis of everything. So, so they're sort of offering something new. Now, uh, that's the problem with the synthesis, right? That what, what Strauss is going to subsequently call a compromise, right? And remember, uh, always laying in the wings Jerusalem and Athens. That's sort of the synthesis everyone wants to make. That's the one that everyone lusts for, to, to speak crassly of it. Uh, the sort of the faith-seeking understanding, uh, you know. Um, now, what Strauss is going to say, and this is so hilarious, because again, he's, he, we, see, we see him sort of imitating Socrates at this point. Uh, he, he says sort of uh, the totality of all positions, uh, it wants to, it, 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 it needs a synthesis, right? Uh, and then Strauss says, uh, he asks himself, why, right? Uh, and this is sort of uh, Strauss conjuring up his interlocutor. Uh, I do seem to remember uh, another famous uh, student of philosophy who, would, who always enjoyed conjuring up an interlocutor when needed, uh, even gods when needed. He would conjure up a god when needed. Uh, obviously, I'm speaking of uh, uh, Plato, Socrates. Uh, the most important instance being, uh, and I just noted it in the notes, uh, Apology uh, 20 uh, CD, uh, when he says, uh, uh, so, okay, so uh, somebody might ask, right, uh, Socrates, what is your pragma, right? Uh, so anytime that someone says, uh, someone's going to ask me this question, uh, it's probably important to pay attention to what that question is. Uh, and so Strauss says, well, why do, we, why do we do that? And he says, it's because they're all equivalent. Uh, and this I would su submit for your consideration as Strauss speaking in the narrator voice, not his own. Uh, now, he's going to immediately say the following. Uh, the problem with claiming that all points of view are valid, all standards are equivalent, is that that's not from a position of naivety, right? Remember, he's saying we need to get there to, to being naive. That's coming into things with a presumption of knowledge already. You know, it, it's like, uh, there's a funny line, I think Hugh Grant says something, uh, uh, Sandra Bullock says, no, he says something to Sandra, Sandra Bullock says like, you're, you're the most uh, annoying man on the planet. And Hugh Grant says, really? have you met every man on the planet, right? Uh, so, so that's sort of where we are, right? Uh, we say things like, uh, well, you know, uh, you know, it's your truth, live your truth. Uh, you know, they're all sort of equally valid. Uh, really, uh, have, you all, have you submitted all of them to meticulous scrutiny, right? Because unless you've done that, you can't go into things saying that they're all valid, right? Because that required, that begs uh, a sort of justification, an argument. 
uh, and the way that right, I Joe, freeze... let me just, inter- let me just, sorry, let me just get in there for one second. Yeah. Same with yeah. like people have always thought or Greek culture or the, you know, all of these phrases that cover over every British man or whatever, right? Every guy in the world. If you say, oh, the Greeks thought this. Yeah, you sure? You've read all the Greeks. You've read the most thoughtful of the Greeks. You've compared the differences and the similarities among them, you know? So we, the laziness of our reading is reflected in the work that we save ourselves by means of these generalizations that spare us actually having to do the heavy lifting of seeing what there is to see in each particular text or author. You know what I mean? Like that's super, that's gotta be very clear for everybody because if Joe is right, that we see ourselves in this conspectivism, then we should begin to be uh, struck by laziness, not just of our reading, but the laziness of analysis in ourselves and in others. When we put too much, again, spare ourselves the labor, spare ourselves the work, A synthesis assumes we've already understood well enough to synthesize. We already know what there is to know to bring A and B together. Whereas Strauss says, we don't even know the first thing about it. How could we? Yeah, I keep thinking of this beautiful line in Heidegger's Being in Time, and I can't recall it exactly, but uh, he says something to the effect that Plato knew damn well uh, that any synthesis first requires an analysis or something like that. I'll I'll have to find it, but it's, it's really quite beautiful. Uh, and, and I just will throw this out there, not, not to be provocative, but again, uh, I think that we all do need to sometimes sort of be jarred uh, into realizing how relevant this stuff can be, right? Uh, you know, Alex Prio sort of did that space with me on why Plato's Republic is literally so deeply relevant to us right now. Uh, and so what I would say about these sort of uh, sparing ourselves the hard work of thought, uh, what, what Michael just pointed out, we're seeing that right now with regard to things like genitalia or skin color, right? Uh, you know, how can you say these sort of blanket statements uh, about someone based entirely on their genitalia or someone based entirely on their skin color? Now, again, I'm not taking a stance on that. I'm just saying this is, uh, we all see it every day. It's, it's in our face. Uh, so that's something just to be aware of. Now, uh, the, the way that I phrased it, uh, which I thought was kind of funny, uh, is, is, uh, So to presume we already know fundamental truth prior to investigation, uh, that means that pre-theoretically, we have theory, right? So so pre-theoretically, you're already theoretical. And what I would suggest is that's a great way to define ideology, right? Ideology is uh, when your sort of default, your pre-theoretical position uh, is already one of that presumes a, a kind of theory. Now, uh, this is going to be important because the defining characteristic uh, of our cave, right, or, or at least what most makes it our cave, uh, Strauss is going to lay that sort of squarely on this thing he calls historical consciousness. Now, when historical consciousness comes up, that's important because it's not as simple as sort of the late German ide- uh, ide- idealists, right? Uh, Strauss is actually going to push that all the way back uh, to Descartes, and I, I would argue he's, he's maybe even going to do it a little sooner. Uh, there are a number of different ways you can argue this, for instance, uh, with, uh, well, actually, he does make it very explicit, uh, and I'm just sort of going to let it out of the bag. Uh, that's why he brought up Maimonides. That's why Maimonides was so important, uh, because uh, in the guide uh, to the perplexed, and he's going to end this essay on pointing that out. In the Guide to the Perplexed, Maimonides, I think it's, uh, it's book one, chapter 31. That's, where it's, that's, that's the all-important uh, chapter, if I remember correctly. Uh, Maimonides is going to say, he's going to list these different things for why there is a sort of jumble uh, of opinions that are hard to decipher. Uh, and he's going, to, he's going to list, I think, seven, if I remember correct, it might be five, but five or seven. Uh, and, he, and of all of them, he's going to say one is new, just one. And what's that new one? Well, it's going to be books. Now, let's just sort of think for a minute. What is the book? Well, the book uh, is the holy book. The book is the Bible. That's going to be what's new for us. 
that's not going that's not to say that uh it's that's not a condemnation that's not a criticism that's simply saying that there is something new under the sun and that new thing under the sun goes by the name divine revelation that's going to make things new and strauss is going to point that out as being the most important thing to keep in mind in understanding uh the cave beneath the cave uh now i'm I, I need to be very emphatic here. I am not saying uh, that uh, divine revelation is so problematic that it's created this cave within a cave, like, oh my God, we can't even get back to the natural level. That's not what I'm saying. I'm simply saying that it has added something new. Uh, and that something new, it can be problematic. Uh, and, and what Maimonides is going to be arguing, and, and Strauss is sort of following suit here, is that this sort of there's a way to think of divine revelation as a path uh, remember uh, the, the pathos of progress is that you know oh those those greeks didn't have uh christ or those greeks didn't have uh jerusalem uh they didn't have the divine law but we have that now so uh you know uh what what, what was the famous line when when they burned the library of alexandria uh, it's, it's apocryphal. I don't know if it's true or not. Uh, but the claim was that, uh, you know, uh, it's got all these great books. Uh, but if they're also great, they're already contained in the teaching of the Quran. Uh, and if they're not in the teaching of the Quran, they're superfluous. Burn it down, right? <laughs> so, right? Uh, QED, all we needed. Uh, and so that's, that's the kind of pathos of progress right there. So the cave beneath the cave, uh, while all this talk of Nietzsche and Heidegger, very important, to be sure, uh, it's actually going to be even deeper and closer to our lives uh, than anything that, that Nietzsche or Heidegger might have written. Uh, something so pre-theoretical, so default by us that we might take for granted, uh, that we might not ever get back to that natural level of being naive, right? Because remember, we need to be unselfconscious and naive. That's what he's saying we need to get to. That's going to be the natural, Strauss is going to call this the natural level of ignorance. That's the natural cave, right? The cave of Plato, right? Uh, what he's saying is we're not there. Uh, we've somehow found ourselves down below. Uh, now, when he brings up the cave beneath the cave in persecution and the art of writing, he's going to say that we've, we've invented these new tools uh, this, you know, and, and there I would say uh, that that's when we're going to get into the real uh, problem of things like historicism, etc. Uh, that's going to be these sort of new inventions and stuff like that. But the, the question that I would pose, and again, I'm just speculating, like I'm not saying that my answer is the definitive answer, not at all, uh, because I know even in this space or this chat, there are people who are more knowledgeable of this than I will ever be. Uh, period. I could study for the rest of my life and they'll, they'll have me beat. Uh, but I just want to say that that is something that has to be reckoned with, is that divine revelation itself, uh, not so much this question of historicism, uh, resolve, right? That's sort of the, the, the great thing, uh, the great problem uh, with human agency uh, that we have in postmodernity. If reason is completely problematic, uh, well, what is there left to do? Well, resolve, right? Uh, that's dangerous, certainly, uh, for any understanding of political prudence, uh, which is always at the core of what Strauss is concerned with. Uh, but even more importantly is going to be, I would suggest, this question of how we handle divine revelation, because until we are able to reconcile ourselves with the fact that divine revelation has uh, taken away an aspect of our ability to get back to that natural level, uh, we're never going to find a way uh, as students of philosophy, not to say as a civilization. I'm not, I'm not advocating anything like that. And I certainly don't think Strauss is. Uh, but he is certainly pointing out that as students of philosophy, which again, uh, to emphasize, is very rare for Strauss. Real students of philosophy, very rare. Actual philosophers, even more rare. Lucky to have one in, in alive when you're living. Uh, so let's always keep that in mind, right? Because we all know the criticisms made against Strauss, right? Uh, I mean, we don't even need to rehash those. So 
I would simply say that a lot of that is sort of the, the, the non-dangerous reader, right? It's like, oh, those Claremont people, oh, a bunch of fascists. Look, we're not even, we don't even have to concern ourselves with that. We have to simply concern ourselves with the people uh, who are taking these things serious, which I think we all are here. Uh, and so that's, that's the key. Uh, Joe, now, let me just underscore, I just want to underscore the point that Joe is making for everybody and that he's getting from Strauss's presentation. The cave beneath the cave is a new challenge for the possibility of philosophy. For the, it's a new obstacle to philosophizing. In addition to the already existing natural obstacles to philosophizing that are represented in Plato's allegory of the cave. Every philosopher has to begin with the problem of our natural state with respect to education and our lack of education, as he puts it at the start of book seven, and undergo, in the best case scenario, the turning around of the soul. That whole process that leads to the best possible way of life and to a certain extent, the peak of human existence. But you can only begin that when you're in your state of natural ignorance. The cave beneath the cave means we have to do some work just to get to the point where the possibility of philosophy is accessible to us again. Yeah, that, that's, that's a perfect segue for me to point out. Uh, this, is, this is, I think, the most important aspect of the essay. Possible, well, I mean, besides Maimonides, because remember, Maimonides came up for a reason and he's not gonna get into much detail about it. I would simply suggest for people that Maimonides is, if he's not the key to Strauss, he's on the keychain. <laughs> <laughs> of Strauss, right? Uh, now, uh, and this is sort of it, this is the top of page 231 for people who have it or people who are going back to read it. Um, he's already pointed out ideology, right? Uh, and he's saying that it's very possible that the reason uh, this synthesis, that these various syntheses that people are attempting to make are all wrong is because they're based on a singular, right, a uh, fundamental, uh, a, mis a mistaking of fundamental facts. Uh, and he's going to call those ideologies, right? And now he says, uh, to know the present as it is, because remember, that was sort of the, that was the question we started with, right? What the religious situation of the present. So now he's going to say, to know the present as it is, uh, we must first be free of the present. And what he means by being free of the present is being free of the ideologies, to be aware that the ideologies are very, very problematic for understanding the actual fundamental facts that we need to know. Uh, and so uh, he says, uh, now, and this is, this is sort of the line, this is the key, where, because remember I said from the very beginning, there was these sort of hints that he was, that the action of the essay was going to be uh, in tandem with a uh, crawling out of the cave, right? Uh, so now he's actually going to, I would suggest, make it explicit. He says, uh, to know the present as it is, uh, we must first be free of the present. This freedom does not fall in our lap. Uh, and here's the line, we must win it for ourselves. Uh, that I would suggest for you uh, is, uh, that's when you say full stop, okay, we're talking about winning something for ourselves. We're talking about uh, having to attain something, to achieve something. Uh, that's going to be the ascent. Uh, the, right? When he says it doesn't fall into our laps, he's saying you can't ascend just like, you know, sort of uh, <laughs> Alex Priot had these absolutely hilarious gifts and he he's deleted them since for obvious reasons. But uh, everyone remembers when Trump came down the elevator, right? Uh, there was a gift that Alex had with Trump going back up the elevator. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, okay, go back to where you came from. Uh, that, in other words, going back up the elevator, right? Uh, ascent doesn't just naturally happen. Uh, we have to win it for ourselves. Um, and what I, what I point out is we have here perhaps the strongest indication of ascent from a cave, our cave, uh, which is to say the cave beneath the cave. Now, uh, if, you, if you're taking notes or if you have this uh, text with you, uh, here's what I would sort of direct you to. Uh, page 235 is where he just said that. And now I would suggest for your consideration that you compare that uh, to page 248 and 249. 
that's going to be the third essay, The Intellectual Situation of the Present, where he gets even more explicit about the pit or the cave beneath the cave. Um, now, this is, this is sort of the last thing, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop. Uh, he's, he says, he's, he said just a little bit earlier, he said, in order to not be shipwrecked, okay, to be shipwrecked is going, to, that image is very important in Strauss, uh, because there's going to be some key points in his, his own intellectual journey, uh, where he says that he himself has become shipwrecked. Uh, and and it, so the question is, what did he become shipwrecked upon? Now, he says that in this essay of 1932, uh, and this is, this is uh, what I would suggest. So, so I'm gonna sort of juggle two things at the same time here. Uh, he just says, uh, our freedom to philosophize, uh, it's limited because we are not naive, right? Uh, we have, or his exact words, we're dominated by, uh, uh, and this is on page 246 in the next essay, uh, a pathos of progress. Okay, so what is that pathos of progress all about? Well, he tells us exactly what it's about. Uh, he says, a pathos of progress in knowledge through knowledge. Okay, so again, we pause. We have a pathos of progress, so that's we have a passion of progress. Uh, and then point two, uh, in knowledge, right? And what I would suggest is what he means by in knowledge uh, is that's going to be our prideful element, our hubris to believe that we, that we know better, right? So uh, we have a pathos of, of progress in our pride thinking we know better and then, and through knowledge. I would suggest that what he means by through knowledge is our institutions. I think that he's indicating right there uh, the problem of our, our belief in progress, it's not only in our knowledge, but it's continuing to be, be propagated through the institutions by which, you know, we disseminate that knowledge. Uh, now, maybe not, now everyone's aware we have institutional problems presently. I'm, that's not necessarily what I'm talking about, but I am talking about, because remember, Strauss learns an awful lot from Nietzsche. The people who receive the most frequent, uh, I'll call it a pimp slap. <laughs> the people who receive the most pimp slaps from Nietzsche uh, are going to be professors. Uh, and Nietzsche actually writes, uh, he doesn't finish it, but he writes uh, a, a dialogue, a kind of platonic dialogue really. Heidegger does too, by the way, uh, about science, uh, which is fascinating. Uh, but uh, Nietzsche writes a dialogue and it's about our institutions, uh, our educational institutions and their ideals. So again, this is, I would suggest for you, and remember Strauss is going to write essays about what is liberal education. So fundamentally Strauss is deeply concerned with our institutions. And why is he concerned with those? Well, because he's concerned about the fate of philosophizing right, uh, which is to say what the meaning of liberal education is for us, right, for us, uh, and, and he's actually already gone so far as to say that for us as Jews becomes for us simply, so for all of us, so he's already sort of transcended uh, in, those, in, those, in those rapid fire iterations of the question, he's already turned it into a, uh, what we might think of as a kind of parochial question for uh, one group of believers, uh, or uh, of uh, monotheism, he's turned it into a group for everyone. But again, I want to emphasize when he's talking about getting out of the cave beneath the cave, I do not think he's talking about as a civilization. I think he's talking about the philosophizers, right? The, the philo well, philosophers. Uh, because remember, uh, what informs the institutions? Well, the thought that wins the day. And what's the thought that wins the day? Well, it's the people who are understood to be the philosophers. Right, so it's kind of this sort of incestuous relationship, and it's, I don't mean that in a, in a sinful, bad way necessarily, uh, but that's going to be the problem, and that itself is very much a political problem, very much a political problem. Uh, so you see there again, philosophy, political philosophy, uh, all come together with Strauss uh, and these 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 separations uh, or these syntheses 
are not at all very clear. In fact, uh, that's where they become, I would, I would say, uh, most interesting. Um, and I, that's, that's pretty much all I have. Uh, well, hold on. I did, I did want to add one last thing. And this comes directly from the Spinoza book. And this is why it is so important. Remember, I, I mentioned previously, Strauss is really homing in on the way we use certain words. Words like culture, words like intellectual, uh, words like values. The most important word for the transformation that takes place in modernity and in, in modern philosophy, and he's very explicit about this in the third essay, uh, is the movement from the word opinion to the word prejudice. In its deepest sense, uh, what I would suggest is that uh, the question of historicism for Strauss is going to be uh, very deeply related to the transformation of, of the word uh, opinion to prejudice, because prejudice is going to carry a negative connotation. It's pejorative. It's going to assume that that is problematic. In other words, prejudice is going to be everything that, that gets the Cartesian doubt the, the Cartesian acts of doubt, right? If it's a prejudice, chop it off, right? Uh, send those things aside uh, and just begin all anew. Uh, and what Strauss is, is saying and what he's getting from these philosophers that he's reading is that's what's so crucial about Plato. Uh, and, and that's going to be in sort of Maimonides and stuff is the element of opinion, right? Remember uh, what is first for us, not what is first simply. That's where you start. Uh, you don't start with, for instance, in Spinoza's ethics, uh, with axiom axioms, and then make deductions from those. That's not, that's not sort of, I mean, I think Strauss actually says at one point, uh, if it all works, it's sort of coincidental. Uh, we don't have any reason to believe it works. It just sort of makes for a good argument that you can sort of think about. Uh, but we have to begin with the element of opinion. And as long as we sort of pre-reflectively doubt everything, uh, we're cut off from that. Uh, and that, that notion uh, of prejudice for Strauss, I would suggest, is actually, he's, he's placing it as a, uh, a philosophical concept. And it's a philosophical concept that is deeply laden uh, with what's going to become historicism. Uh, and that's so let me just make one let me just make one comment about that. And this will be a good place for us to stop. Many of you may know Alan Bloom's Closing of the American Mind. And he wrote about professors who felt like their responsibility was to remove prejudices from the students, attack ruthlessly all of their prejudices, and leave them with no guidance, with nothing in place of that. And to a certain extent, that's the situation that students can be in when the Enlightenment tries to remove prejudice instead of fostering, you know, seeing the relationship between knowledge and opinion and the value and purpose of opinion instead of just this ruthless attack on prejudice that leaves you with a new set of prejudices that you think are enlightenment, you know? So this whole problem is absolutely crucial for not just Strauss, but for his students and for that book in particular. So look, there's a lot more that we can discuss. Every single thought that we've raised so far, we could do two more hours on easily because it branches out into so much more in Strauss and it branches out into so much more in our own lives and in our own situation won't call it an intellectual situation we'll take strauss's guidance on that one but in any event this has been a great meeting i hope it's left everybody with a lot of food for thought at the very least you got a chance to meet uh joe if that's your real name the athenian stranger if that's yeah. your real name yeah whoever and, that uh, name is i don't know yeah everybody's nicknames we know here we don't know who's who or what's what all that we know is that it's been a real pleasure and a real delight and so if that's the most that we had uh, in our time together today, Dainu, as the Jewish tradition says, that would be enough in and of itself. At the same time, you've been made aware of this volume, Reorientations. So you have some new access to Strauss and to some essays in Strauss, to the development of Strauss. And you can make of that what you will. Hopefully this has given you something to work with there. For those of you who are in the school, I want to thank you for your uh, business. I hope that you're enjoying the, course, the courses that are offered and you see the connection here with Dugan and Noamakia, who deals with the problem of progress and becoming Platonists, with the Strauss courses, obviously, with the Republic course and everything else. So if you're in the school, thank you. If you're considering taking a course, thank you. And if you're not at all, and you're just here because you wanted to see Joe and myself and hear a conversation on Strauss, thank you. I really, truly appreciate it. I know Joe does too. It's been yeah. great being with everybody, and I look forward to the next time we can do this together. So I suggest we leave it there. 
and uh, reconvene on Twitter and wherever else we reconvene uh, until the next get together. Good. Thanks so much, Michael. Really appreciate this more than you know, my man. Fantastic. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Good night. Goodbye.